Cantrips are considered level 0 spells, and can be used an unlimited amount of times per day, unlike other higher level spells. So in this list we'll be going over 10 of the best cantrips that are great picks for whichever class are able to actually use them. And at number 10 we have Mage Hand. This cantrip is either incredibly convenient and useful in all kinds of situations, or it only provides incredibly minor conveniences. You see, what this spell does is it allows you to create a floating spectral hand, and you can use this hand to move stuff around as long as whatever it's moving weighs less than 10 pounds. It only lasts a minute, can only go out to around 30 feet, and can't be used to attack or activate magic items. Now, what makes this cantrip so useful is the fact that it can kind of trivialize a lot of traps you might come across in dungeons. If you need to pick up an item that you think might have some kind of trap associated to it, you can just have your mage hand do it while you stay safely 30 feet away. And it's able to trigger a lot of traps you might come across, but there are some DMs who might make an item exactly 11 pounds, for example, so that you can't use mage hand to trivialize their traps, or some other minor change that you can't use mage hand to get out of every situation. So it's really as useful as you are creative with using it, or what your DM will let it accomplish. And Mage Hand gets even more useful if you're an Arcane Trickster Rogue. You see, Arcane Tricksters have this thing called Mage Hand Ledger Demain, which makes Mage Hand accomplish a whole bunch of other more complicated tasks, where the hand can be invisible and make other things invisible if they're able to completely cover the object. You can use Mage Hand to use your Thieves tools, which makes them even better at dealing with traps in dungeons. As oftentimes, traps will be attached to a door that needs to be unlocked and you can even use it to steal stuff at range, as it allows you to perform sleight of hand checks with it. Although you need three levels in Rogue in order to accomplish these things, so baseline Mage Hand can be incredibly convenient, but you also kind of need a lenient DM or a very creative mind. And at number 9 we have Word of Radiance. Word of Radiance is an AoE cantrip that can only be used by clerics or other classes if you take the Magic Initiate feat, and it allows you to do 1d6 radiant damage to all targets within 5 feet of the caster, assuming they fail a constitution save, as all cantrips with saving throws are all or nothing situations, where you either take all the damage or none of the damage. And while 1d6 damage isn't a lot, it is one of the few AoE cantrips in the game, and it does that ever so important radiant damage. Radiant damage is one of the least resisted types of damage, although I should say it's not THE least resisted type. But another good distinction about radiant damage is that a lot of monsters who have the ability to regenerate or heal do not regenerate if they've taken radiant damage in the last turn. So it's a really good way to shut off a lot of healing from different types of monsters. Or I guess I should say not a good way, you do have to get a little close to use a word of radiance, and Sacred Flame might be better if all you need is radiant damage, since it's a ranged attack cantrip that does 1d8 damage with a 60 foot range. But word of radiance can hit multiple targets, and also has the added feature where it can sometimes shut down healing. Although that damage is really low, and if you really need to attack multiple targets, it might be better to just use a leveled spell. But if you're surrounded by a swarm or a whole bunch of low HP minions, this is a convenient way to maybe kill all of them without having to use a spell slot, or at the very least whittle them down a bit. This spell does scale with your level, going all the way up to 46 damage at level 17, so if you use it at high levels it can definitely kill low HP minions very quickly. But at high levels you'll probably have easy access to leveled spells, so you probably won't worry too much about having an AoE cantrip. Which is why this is kind of low on the list. Out of the very few AoE cantrips, this one hits about as hard as all the others, and also has a pretty good damage type. And at number 8 we have Message. Message is a cantrip that allows you to send secret messages easier, as long as someone is within 120 feet of you and not blocked by closed solid objects. You can whisper a message to them where only the target can hear whatever you told them, and the more important part is that they can also reply in a whisper that only you can hear. So as long as one person has this cantrip, they can hold a private conversation with someone else who doesn't have the cantrip, since it allows them to speak back and forth as long as one person casts it. Now it's not like telepathy, so other creatures can see you talking if they can't hear it, and while you don't need line of sight on the target, they do kind of have to be in an open-ish space for the message to work, so it's not super effective at coordinating things from across large buildings or dungeons. But there are lots of situations in which you'd want to have a private conversation where no one else can hear you. Like if you're in a political intrigue campaign and you wish to talk to someone about something important in the middle of a party, but you don't want anyone else to listen in. Message is perfect for those kinds of situations. Or if you're in front of a large enemy group and you're attempting to talk your way out of it, 
You can formulate a strategy with one other person in your group without accidentally making the aggressive enemy group in front of you more angry. Although, if your DM allows you to make all of these arrangements in front of enemy groups without them hearing anything you say anyway, from like a meta standpoint, it's probably not as useful. But it's also useful for party members to talk to each other. Sometimes you need to coordinate things across the room or across the street in the middle of the city. That message can kind of work like a walkie-talkie, to an extent. Being able to share information is super valuable, and for doing it on a cantrip that doesn't require a spell slot is pretty convenient. And at number 7, we have Spare the Dying. This is a cantrip that only artificers and clerics can use, which allows you to stabilize a party member who's rolling death saves, just as long as you're able to touch them and use this cantrip. And if you're a Grave Domain Cleric, it has a 60 foot range and can be used as a bonus action, which is really where it's best used. Now, one of the best uses of this is that you don't need to use a healer's kit or rely on a medicine check DC 10 in order to stabilize someone. It's just a one and done stabilize someone without worrying about them dying. It is better to just heal someone in order to stabilize them, as Spare the Dying doesn't actually bring them back into the battle, it just stops them from having to roll death saves. However, there are no healing cantrips, and if you don't have an available spell slot, this is kind of the best you can do. And it's also kind of important for at least one person to be able to do something like Spare the Die in order to just have some kind of heal, because it's not really a good idea to let someone rely on death saves, as there's so few ways to increase the modifiers or gain advantage on those rolls. And even if you do have a healer, it could still be useful. Say, for example, two of your party members go down. You can use Healing Word on one of them with your bonus action, and then you Spare the Dying on the other one with your regular action. One of them gets to join the battle, and the other one no longer has to worry about rolling death saves. And at number 6, we have Shillelagh. This is a cantrip that only druids can use, or other classes if they have a way to take cantrips from other classes, which is one of the few bonus action cantrips in the game, which allows you to convert a club or quarter staff made of wood into a magical version of it that deals 1d8 damage. And it also allows you to use your spellcasting modifier instead of strength for the attack and damage rolls. Now, all of this is actually super good. This could be one of the only ways to get a magical weapon if you're low level and facing off against that monster that's resistant to non-magical weapons. Since it allows you to use your spellcasting modifier for those rolls, that allows spellcasters to have a decent melee option at early levels, in case they're forced into melee range. And it also does good damage for a one-handed weapon, as the quarterstaff does have the option to be used one-handed. You see, 1d8 is the same as a rapier or a longbow. A rapier is the highest damaging one-handed finesse weapon in the game, with its d8 dice damage, and the longbow is the highest damaging bow, with a 1d8 damage. So a d8 is kind of the upper limit for a lot of non-two-handed weapons or crossbow weapons. So being able to create a magic weapon that uses your spellcasting modifier and deals good damage is a lot of good stuff packed into one. The spell does only last one minute, but that is generally enough time to last an entire battle especially since you just need to use your first bonus action in order to apply this effect to a weapon. Or it can even be done before combat starts. Although, one of the problems with this is generally spellcasters aren't going to want to do melee damage at all, even if they can use their spellcasting modifier, because chances are they won't have any kind of multi-attack or any other features that combo well with the weapon. So it's incredibly good for a cantrip, but it's probably not something you want to go out of your way to use like you do some of the higher spots on this list especially since it doesn't really scale in the late game. And at number 5, we have Toll the Dead. Toll the Dead is potentially the hardest hitting cantrip in the game, as what it does is force one target to perform a wisdom saving throw, and if they fail, they take damage depending on what their maximum hit point value is. If they are at maximum hit points, they take 1d8 necrotic damage, which hey, isn't half bad, but if they are below max health, then they take 1d12 necrotic damage which is the highest damage dice out of all the cantrips. And since it requires a saving throw instead of an attack, it's actually a lot better to use on a whole bunch of monsters who have high AC values, and probably have pretty low wisdom saves. Wisdom is generally not a stat that a lot of monsters have a high amount of, so it's going to be very dependent on whatever campaign you're running with how successful this one cantrip will be or not. But if you want one of the hardest hitting cantrips, since most of the time you'll be using this on monsters that are not at full health, Toll the Dead is kind of one of the best options to take if you don't have any other class abilities or items that modify the damage of some of your other damaging cantrips. And there's also the whole thing where it can potentially do no damage if they do make the save. But that's the same for all damaging cantrips, so I wouldn't really count that as a negative. It can only be used by three classes, but that's not super restrictive. 
So not all spell counters have access to it, but the ones that do can't really go wrong with this one as one of their damaging options. Especially since this does also scale, like most other damaging cantrips, ending off at 4d12 damage at level 17 and above. And at number 4, we have Chill Touch. Now, despite the name of this cantrip, it actually has a 120 feet range and not a range of touch, which is pretty far for a cantrip. Toll the Dead only has a 60 foot range, for example. And what it does on an attack roll is if it hits, it deals 1d8 necrotic damage. 1d8 is lower than something like Firebolt, which deals 1d10 damage on a ranged attack roll. And the benefit Chill Touch has over something that does a little bit more damage is that if you land the attack, the target can't regain hit points until the start of your next turn. And it also has the extra bonus effect, where undead targets hit by it have disadvantage on attack rolls against you until the end of your next turn. Although it's that whole cannot regain hit point thing that makes this such a powerful cantrip. Players will take Chill Touch for that one effect alone, because there's lots of high level monsters that have natural healing, and this just completely prevents that from happening without needing to have a specific type of damage to counter it like radiant or fire damage. It also prevents them from getting healed by other things as well, so they can't have a backup healer bringing them up to full HP with one super once per day heal, like the Narzugon's healing ability for example. It's honestly a good idea for at least one person to have chill touch in your party, especially if you're about to go into a big boss fight that you know might have healing. The fact that it also deals decent-ish damage on top of this, as chill touch does scale with its levels as well, is kind of icing on the cake. The only things that really beat Chill Touch when it comes to good cantrips would probably only be the top three, but even those could be arguable. And at number three, we have Prestidigitation. This is probably one of the most versatile spells you can pick up, as it basically allows you to do one of any minor magical effect that you can think of. So it's really as good as you are creative at using it, but outside of just being creative with it, one of the more actual useful instances of it is the fact that it can basically be used as a quick shower. So, if you just got into a bloody fight you need to convince some people coming by that you're not murderers, press the digitation can clean the blood off almost instantly. It could even make you smell good if you need to go into a noble's house, for example, to ask for a favor. Because chances are you probably smell really bad if you're an adventurer. Now, it has a whole bunch of different effects listed on it. It allows you to create a puff of wind, low musical notes, an odd odor, light or put out candles, chill, flavor or warm up food, or even make marks or color appear on surfaces. And there's this one little thing with prestidigitation where it says it allows you to make a symbol on an object or surface for one hour, but it doesn't specify the size of the symbol. So if you want to be annoying to your DM, you could argue that it allows you to create a symbol on the side of an entire building with one cast of it, or the entirety of a dungeon floor so that you can track an invisible creature or something. I wouldn't recommend using it this way, but it doesn't give specifications on how big you can make it, so you could kind of argue that it works that way. And you can have up to three effects of it at a time, so there's just lots of creative ways to use it. And there's two other similar cantrips to prestidigitation. There's also thaumaturgy and druidcraft, which are able to do a whole bunch of other minor magical effects. So if you want to be able to do one of almost any minor magical thing, taking all three of these cantrips would probably accomplish that. But if you can only pick one, Prestidigitation is arguably the best of the three. And at number two, we have Guidance. This cantrip allows you to touch a willing creature in order to give them the buff, which allows them to add a d4 to any one ability check of their choice at the next minute. Now, what's really good about this cantrip is the fact that a lot of ability checks are done outside of combat, and you can use it an unlimited amount of times. If you need to make any kind of skill check outside of combat, and you have someone in your group that has guidance, you basically always have an additional 1d4 to that skill check. Which is just so valuable that guidance is arguably the best cantrip in the game. The only reason I have it at number 2 is because this one is kind of reliant on your DM as well. They might not let you use guidance in a whole bunch of different kinds of situations. Like if you need to perform a persuasion roll, they'll probably disallow using guidance to add a d4 to it or in any other kind of social situation, which is totally fair, the enemy party would be able to see someone casting this as it does have a verbal component to it. But it does also last for a minute, so if you're creative with it and think ahead, you could just cast it in secret, and then they'll just have that roll for the next minute as long as you concentrate on it. Although even if your DM doesn't like it and disallows in a whole bunch of situations, mechanically speaking, there's still lots of advantages to it in so many other kinds of non-social situations. Performing skill checks happens all the time. It also allows the person to cast it on themselves. 
So you basically have an unlimited additional D4 rolls to everything outside of combat. There are only three classes that can use it, Artificers, Clerics, and Druids, so there is the chance that no one in your party will be able to take a Guidance, but if you do have someone of those three classes, there's a good chance they're taking this cantrip unless someone else already has it. This isn't really one that everyone in the party needs to have. Kind of one of those things where only one person needs to have it, unless they just never use it on anyone else. And at number one, we have Eldritch Blast, which should basically just be a baseline Warlock ability and not a cantrip. Now, this is basically just a damaging cantrip, so Guidance would be more useful than it depending on what kind of campaign you're running. But when it comes to damaging cantrips, Eldritch Blast is kind of one of the best. It doesn't hit the hardest out of all of them, that would probably be Toll the Dead with its d12 damage, but Eldritch Blast deals 1d10 force damage, which is the least resisted type of damage in the game. So there's a good chance Eldritch Blast is going to work on whatever you're using it on. It has a 120 foot range, just like most other long range cantrips, and it has the special distinction when you're at higher levels, where instead of the cantrip dealing extra damage at higher levels, it just kind of allows you to fire extra Eldritch Blasts with each cast. You see, it's kind of a little bit complicated. When you're at level 17, normally the damage dice would be three times higher. So Firebolt would deal 4d10 damage on a single attack roll. But with Eldritch Blast, the same action would deal 1d10 force damage four times, which requires four separate rolls. And what's great about this is you can direct all four of those rolls into multiple targets. So you could hit four different enemies with a single cast of Eldritch Blast. Or you could pull them all into one target and just have more chances to roll four crits, which is super valuable. Although you're not actually casting four different Eldritch Blasts, more like it separates when you cast one of them into four bolts, so you can't use two of the bolts and then save the other two for moving into a different room in order to attack two new targets you just saw. You have to use them all at once, but you can direct them to four different targets. And this is a very valuable distinction with things that add damage to all hits, like some of the Warlock Eldritch Invocations. You see, some people will take two levels in Warlock just to get Eldritch Blast and Warlock Invocations, because they have like five different invocations that specifically only affect Eldritch Blast. That's why I said it's basically a Warlock ability. One of them allows you to add your spellcasting modifier damage to each bolt, which means if you fire four of them at level 17 and above, and you have a Charisma modifier of plus five as an example, that's an additional 20 damage since it fires four separate bolts. There's also an invocation that allows you to push a target 10 feet away from you each time they're hit with Eldritch Blast, which does work on each separate bolt. So attacking them with all four of them at high levels could allow you to push one target back 40 feet, which could even allow you to push targets off of cliffs. The invocations are pretty good on Eldritch Blast, and they're what makes this cantrip shine as one of the best cantrips in the game. Although if you take away the invocations and you just look at baseline Eldritch Blast, it's still a pretty decent damage option that has a unique scaling method in the late game, but it does technically have the potential to do less damage than Toll the Dead, so it's really the invocations that make this ability shine. Although only Warlocks can take Eldritch Blast, so there's a good chance you'll have the invocations if you have two levels in Warlock, as you get two of them once you hit level two. So if you're of a different class and you have the ability to take Eldritch Blast, you probably wouldn't want to do that unless you just really like force damage or the multiple hits thing you can do. So if including at least level 2 Warlock Invocations, Eldritch Blast is definitely the best cantrip in the game. Though Guidance could easily be argued as more useful in a less combat focused campaign, so it really all depends on what kind of game you're running. Alright, and that's the list. If you know of any other better cantrips that should have made this list in place of some of the ones I talked about, I'd love to hear about them down in the comments, as well as ideas for future videos just like this one. 